Hi there, this is uh, Tom from Black Tail Studio and today I will be doing a Codex Space Marines review. Um, this Codex was recently released about a week ago now, so I thought I'd have a quick brief look at it with you guys. And I'm not going to go over too much detail, but just sort of show the layout of it and anything that I find vaguely interesting to start with. So one of the first things I, I, I thought might be worth mentioning is actually just the size of this book. Um, I mean obviously Space Marines has got a, a lot of chapters to cover. and. Uh, I think they've done this, this quite well by giving us a 200 page book in total and it's basically split about 50-50 I think between kind of fluff and uh, actual rules and units etc. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few of them now and uh, a bit of the fluff as well. So the first few pages seem to cover a little bit about the, about the Space Marines themselves um, and along kind of, kind of an origin story as well because I mean they mentioned the, the Primarchs here quite briefly. Uh, which is nice artwork here as well, um, but then go on to sort of you know, forging of the heroes and explaining how Space Marines actually, you know, made essentially, um, and, and the process each phase they go through from to become a Space Marine, um, and then they sort of go on and show the individual chapters that exist now and how they existed back at the beginning and what they're found in chapters, which one's got excuse to get traitorous for being traitors and the Horus Heresy, etc. Um, they have a nice little chapter organisation part here showing how each chapters uh, are broken down into their 10 companies and their organisation at the top etc. And then the, it tends to go into the, the, the base of the main founding chapters um, and uh, you know, the ones that are left anyway that, and the, the breakdown of each one, a little description of you know, each of these chapters. They've got the Ultramarines White scars. Got a nice picture there. Imperial fists. Again, the artwork's pretty pretty good as usual though. Um, and then also they've got a little bit in here about Black Templars and Crimson Fists, which are obviously successor chapters from the Imperial Fists. Um, salamanders. Raven Guard. I believe it's yes, yeah, so it's going to have got the Iron Hands. And then it basically goes on to a little breakdown of company, the first company structure and battle companies. You should get quite a nice little timeline as well. Um, it's got a very brief mention of the Horus Heresy at the beginning, literally from start to end in a couple of. Um, entries on the timeline but then it goes on to sort of show the second founding and then after that it just I think more of a recent history of the Space Marines and up, up till now um, probably probably more focusing on their current you know the current tat chapters rather than the, the history of them um, then essentially from then onwards it, it, it basically you get all the units that you're going to be, you know, having been able to play with, but it just it just gives a, a description of each of them, uh, and more of a kind of like you know what they're about rather than what they do um, in the game. Um, it's quite quite detailed in some places. It's quite nice to have a little bit of you know story background or information on the each of the types of squads, you know, what their role is in the Space Marine armies, etc. I mean, I think it covers actually almost all of them uh, that are listed in the rules section in, in various formats. Um, and yeah, so it goes on to the battle tanks. We've got some quite nice imagery here from for the land raider. Got one of the uh, kind of cutouts like they have in for some of the four drilled uh, books. Quite nice to see the inner workings of a land raider. Um, then we've got the Legion of the Dam sneaking here as well again, which is quite nice. Um, although again, a little bit odd considering they have their own codex, but um, yes, I suppose that they, they have a place in this codex on some level. And then basically the uh, the book goes on to, to show, I suppose, I mean, colour schemes really. I mean, you know, Although it has a little bit of information here, like the heraldry and stuff like that, but it's more about how you might want to paint a an ultramarine chapter for here, for instance. 
uh, and the, you know, the different how the different units are painted within it and identification marks etc etc and the vehicle markings it's got some uh, got nice top down views of the flyers and stuff so you know where to put the markings um, some of the tanks and vehicles etc dreadnought and then basically it then has a section on the ultramarine successor chapters which is quite nice and obviously he's had the ultramarine's had the most successes by the looks of it so i think they had the most outstanding army at the end of the uh, heresy so the first family then got split down quite quickly And then it basically here's we've got the white scars and again imperial fists, salamanders, raven guard. And then it basically there's a little block here as you can see it's a bit bit, bit different to the ultramarines because instead of having it after each one they've just blocked all the rest of them into one section. So you've got like the white scars here, the raven guards the of chapters here, the imperial fist ones. Notably there's the black templars down there which are I'm a personal collector of, so I'll be going into probably a bit more detail there in the late date. Um, then we've got the art world, uh, the well, artwork splitting up the, the next part of the book because the base chambers you came as it seems to be a nice artwork set, art, artwork section, just showing more model based stuff. Um, quite like that one there. That's quite a nice imperial fist. Uh, Eventually, then we get into the heavy metal section, which is basically showing individual paint jobs of the um, of certain units within the collection of models. As usual, very nicely done. Nice poses, and just gives you a nice idea of how you might want to do your own units. Right now, we get to the the first part of the major rules bit, um, and as is the current trend in most of the new. Codexes, we're getting one of these big, you know, picking your, your core auxiliary and command attachments, which is the Gladius Strike Force. Um, uh, yeah, essentially, it's, it's just like we've had in you know, the Eldar and the Necron Codexes, where you get your, you, know, you pick from your core, which obviously there's only one of in, in this, and you can pick up one to two. So it's your Battle Demi Company, and then you, you, you can then you know, essentially zero to three command. So we've got your, your strike force command, reclusion command squad, and Liberius conclave, and then, then you've got your your auxiliaries, uh, which consist of very many different types of, yeah, you know, basically to give you that opportunity to play how you want to play, but still have the overall advantages of, of the, uh, the strike force essentially, and all the command benefits, um, which, are, which are in this case, um, again. You get you get these two here, so your Codex Astartus, uh, which is basically the combat doctrines once per game, yeah, and then the company support, yeah, which is uh, if you include two of the battle demi companies, uh, one one including a captain and the other including a chapter, then together they form a battle company. And then you basically get your free transports, so you know, Razorbacks, dedicated transports, drop pods, etc., um, included in the you know, for free essentially, um, which is quite nice. Um, I mean, personally, I won't be making too much use of it because. As you can see here, uh, it's, uh, it's three tactical squads required, and as I'll be playing with Crusader squads majority of the time, uh, I don't think I'll be using this particular attachment that much um, while I'm playing, uh, mainly because I, I, I prefer to use my Crusader squads over tactical squads because that's Black Templars for you. Uh, but we get our own set of benefits anyway, so I'm not too fussed. Then, as usual, it just basically goes into the HQ sections. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail with these, I'm just going to have a little a brief flip through and I'll stop on a few of the ones that I'm more interested in, which will probably be Black Templar ones as usual. Uh, but you know, you've got all the, you know, Sicarius, Targaryus is back again, uh, Chaplain Cassius, and Sergeant Tellian, all the uh, usual Ultramoon faces, and then we go to what across a Khan, Vulcan, and Shrike. Uh, Lysander and Kentor. So that's all the main chapters cover. And then obviously we got our, the little piece for the, the for the Templars here. So uh, yeah, you've got Marshall Helbrick. Um, in the previous iteration, 
wasn't a huge fan of his rules. Um, they've got a little bit better now. Um, I'd say that his yeah, the Crusader Wrath makes him usable for a nice foot slog army. Um, as you can see, the rules there gives you a nice, gives you hatred and fleet until the end of that phase, once per game on the assault phase, and uh, that makes him quite nice in a foot slogging army. Gives that option to charge a bit more reliably. Uh, I, I, the one that I actually find probably the best change so far is probably the Emperor's Champion. Um, he's kept his 140 points, but essentially he's kept all his upsides and, and lost a couple and a couple of downsides. For instance, the stance is, although quite nice, um, he now just has the the plus two strength and an AP two weapon, which is just melee master crafted. Um, so no more unwieldy on that, which makes him a little bit more usable. Because uh, obviously before with this challenge rules, you, you you may get yourself in challenge and get yourself killed because you're striking last if you wanted to use the strength uh, over the uh, other rules in the in the previous book. Uh, obviously, he still has to challenge, and he still gets instant death on sixes, which is nice, especially with AP two. Um, and he still has to accept any challenge whenever possible. Um, and he's obviously he's now got his two four save. Just that's it. None, none of the uh, having to be in combat to get your four up and things like that. Um, so personally, that'd be one I might be running with a bit more regularly. Um, however, not quite required really as Grimaldus. Um, he's, uh, I think he's probably one of the, the nicer units to pick nowadays, especially with his uh, servitors. And they've snuck in a couple of extra little rules here, so the servitors are giving feel no pain to any units within six inches now, um, which is nice. Uh, and also down here, got our match deal, so anyone within six inches of Grimaldus is getting the Zealot special rule. Um, and also they've, they've lowered his point cost a little bit, which is nice. So I think he's a bit more viable now for people that want to play, um, again, a nice you know, crusading foot, foot sloggy army. Um, although probably <laughs> not going to be that survivable. Um, still a bit of fun. And they've got a nice bit of artwork there for the Templars, throwing all of the uh, leaders there. And then moving on. It's just got the generic HQs. So Captain Librarians, Tech Marines. Yeah, they don't know. They seem to have removed the Master of the Forge now, um, uh, which is, well, I suppose, not completely unexpected when you see some of the other changes they made. I mean, one of the reasons you took Master Forge was for, for more Dreadnought. So I mean, he was actually quite a nice HQ anyway, uh, but yeah, I don't think it was needed. And we've got Chaplains, Tactical Squads, and then Scout Squad. There's been a small change in the stats there. I'll do that to work that one out for scouts. And then uh, Crusader squads. Again, they, they stay pretty much the same. Um, I mean, they've still got the, you know, take up, take all your initiates, and then you can take your near fights for one for every one initiate you've taken, and you upgrade a sword brother in there. Still get you. You can still kind of put in three weapons of some description in the squad due to their upgrade rules, and you can still take a dedicated transport land raider, crusader. Um, so it's quite nice. No point you change there by looks of it. I think it's all still seventy points. And, uh, and then now another interesting thing they've done here is they've moved command squads into elite, along with the honor guard, which is nice. So you're not having to buy the HQs and etc. Just to actually you know get them um, which is always a bit of a pain uh, I've always quite liked the command squad uh, it's quite nice to be able to pack in quite a few special weapons if you're going to drop them in from just for instance a drop pod or something uh, they've got quite a few uses um, I've never really used the honor guard myself but I might give them a go then essentially onto the centurion salt squad and guard veterans now another, they've had a couple of interesting changes as well. Um, I mean, mainly in the points cost of weapon upgrades. I mean, they've made lightning claws and power weapons five points per model now, which is pretty, pretty crazy. But um, makes them a bit more interesting. And then now here's another quite a big change, I think. Uh, dreadnoughts. Uh, all all iterations of this this applies to. So you've got your, your, your dreadnoughts, thin rubber dreadnoughts, and ironclads. But now. Yeah, you can when you buy, when you purchase your first one points wise, you can then include an additional two into that squadron um, for the same cost as obviously a normal normal dreadnought or ironclad, whatever you're buying. So you can take them in 
essentially scores a three for one slot choice now, uh, which in my opinion makes them a little bit more usable. Um, so I think actually having more more dreadnoughts is, uh, if you're going to use them, use quite a few of them, especially if you you've got some you know, army clad ones. I think they're I personally I prefer them, especially if you're walking them across the board. Gives them a little bit more survivability. And if you can take them in threes, you're not you're not taking up three slots uh, just to take those three dreadnoughts that you want to take. Um, I think there's been some little point changes here and there. Uh, I don't think there's anything major. I think it's like five points here or there on certain options. Um, Venables still have the same benefits. And also the other interesting thing is actually they can now get chapter tactics. So, uh, which obviously for Templars is quite nice because that means we'll get Crusade on them, uh, which means they can run a bit faster, more reliably. Uh, then we've got Leaves and the Damned. I don't think there's been much change in them. Now, they have changed Terminator squads. Um, they've lowered their points. However, the upgrades look like they cost a little bit more. I think you end up paying 400 points for a five-man squad with Thunderhammer and uh, Storm Shields, essentially. Uh, which is actually quite nice, because you, you, you used to be four, over 400 points to get that sorted. But um, it's have been standardised, lowered the Terminator cost down to 35 points each. Um, it's very much like the Grey Knight one, where you're just paying for weapon upgrades that you want. Uh, bike squads. Yeah, you still got the um, detachment rule there, which is basically if you put one of your independent characters uh, on a bike, they change the bike squads to troops, which is, which is quite nice. Uh, I think it's been used a lot in the previous edition anyway, so nothing, nothing new there. Um, uh, obviously, the other thing is we've got all the vehicle transport vehicles, which now move into fast attack. Uh, which gives you a few other options for taking. Certainly, you just don't have dedicated transfer options. Um, so, for instance, you can put Terminators in the drop pod now if you want to. <laughs> um, got Storm Town Gunship. Um, I think they've got this new rule here called Vectored Afterburners, which is basically giving it a plus one to its jinx save in hover mode, which is quite nice because obviously they're quite easy to, to knock out the sky. It's quite nice to have that option to jink and have a bit more survivability. The Devastators are uh, pretty much the same, other than the fact that they've had grav weaponry added to their arsenal, which uh, is quite nice. Just gives, brings them online, you know, in line with the Devastator squad, essentially. Although I think I'll probably still take the Devastator squad over the it's a Centurion Devastator squad that is over the normal one. Um, moving on, now, most notably in this section um, is. Yeah, with, uh, they've gone on to taking pretty much all the heavy choices, so Thunderfire Cannons, Predators, Whirlwinds, Indicators, uh, yeah, Hunters, Stalkers, all, all, pretty much all of them now um, you can purchase uh, with, with an additional of that type of unit, so you can take them in threes to take up one slot, and they, when you take three you get your, you get your bonuses, so you know, Predators are getting Monster Hunter and Tank Hunter for having three in their squadron. Um, and thunder fire cannons uh, are, are gaining one blessed skill if they include three. Um, I think whirlwind's got a much needed boost with their suppressive bombardment thing, uh, which basically gives them pinning and shred, uh, regardless of whichever missile it's firing. So obviously, you fire the ignores cover save one, you're, you're basically turning it into a wyvern, which uh, which I quite like. I mean, I may even. Use them, especially at sixty-five points apiece. They're not bad for for grinding up infantry. Uh, Vindicators got their. I think this has been in a previous apocalypse rule section where they get the big apocalyptic blast section, and it gains ignores cover for having three. So that's quite nice having that strength ten AP two shot. Um, it's the ignores cover special rule. Um, I think. I mean, a purse with the hunters and the stalkers. I've never really been a big fan of them ever. Anyway. I'd rather take more things like auto cannons or things like that, just to knock, knock the stuff out of the sky. Um, I mean, they've got the obviously re-rolling its seven lock for them for three, and then the sky storm uh, includes three. You get the ignores cover special rule, which I suppose is quite nice. But again, I, I just wouldn't take three of them because for seventy-five points each, you know, for something that only really shoots at the air, it's not really something I would uh, be that interested in. 
Storm Raven. I think we lost five points on it. So, not too bad. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. And then Land Raiders again. You can take. Uh, I don't think you can take three of them. Uh, I think you actually have to take the formation for this. You have three of them, which has specific rules. Um, and of course, we've got the Lord of War, which I won't ever be using, but it may be interesting to some people, which is obviously Marinus Calgar. Um, and essentially, he can. He's got his Master Tactician rule, which basically you can choose to enact an extra combat doctrine of any type when you choose. Uh, in addition to the three times you use them, and he gets to pick his own warlord trait. Other than that, he's got his nice dog power fist as usual. Again, not something I'll probably be using that much, uh, if at all. <laughs> and then we go into formations. Um, I mean, they've added a lot of formations to be honest. Uh, so you've got the, the, the Demi Company, um, which is one of the main ones. This is you know, be, this is something that some people will be very interested in using quite a bit and uh, again uh, focus around having that core of the, the captain and tactical squads uh, so probably I won't be using that much because again these crusader squads and then um, anti-air defence force I mean all these particular formations have certain abilities that you get but you know if for instance like the terminator one here it just enhances you know, certain things that they'll be doing for instance this gets preferred enemy special rule uh, against a nominated unit and a uh, enemy unit select two from the leadership whilst within 12 inches which is quite nice and these are just the last ones here um, not going to go into too much detail quite like the storm um, so then we've got the storm wing formation uh, I actually quite like this one um, I mean it gives the storm raven you know, it's uh, basically the strafing run, so hitting onto some ground targets, um, which makes it a bit more reliable actually hurting things. Um, you know, there's certain ways you could kit that out to to be effective against either infantry or um, armor. Um, got siege siege breaker cohort. Uh, not too sure about that one. It seems like a lot of points to sink into something that doesn't really give you a huge amount back. Um, and here's the land raider one I was talking about earlier. So, uh, interestingly, this one, um, obviously you take your three land raiders of any variation, um, but you're essentially, models in this one, you're cruise shake, increased stunned, weapon destroyed, and immobilized results on the vehicle damage table, as long as they're in six inches of each other. So, essentially, unless you destroy them, they're always going to be fully effective. Um, but, again, uh, you're talking a big point sink to get three land raiders, I mean, 750, 750 points. That is cheapest, I think. Um, that, although, you know, I could... Potentially see myself doing that for for you know quite an interesting game. You load up all your crusader squads in your land raiders there and have a, a spearhead. Because even though on you know, the other rule you get here is the um, reroll fell wounds and arm penetration against organic creatures and you know, super heavy vehicles and buildings etc. Um, which is quite nice. We've got the Librarius uh, Conclave, which I am led to believe is is quite good. So although I won't be using librarians in my lists. Um, Armoured Task Force and Suppression Force. I think that was in the previous option there anyway. And that's the end of that. So a nice little bit of artwork on the end here. Well, I say artwork, it's some model models, but they have obviously <laughs> added in a few little special effects by the looks of it. Um, let's actually then we go into the appendix, appendices. So we've got the um, Warlord Traits table here. Um, I'm just going to look through these individually. I think these are, a lot of these are very just quite similar to previous ones, but just slightly adjusted. And and then essentially, then we move on to another quite interesting bit is the is the chapter tactics oh, this section. Um, I think most of these are quite similar. Um, uh, again, maybe just a few slight changes in wording. Uh, the Templar one's worth noting. Uh, obviously, we've got Crusader, Adamantium, Will, no librarians, but now we get Righteous Zeal, uh, which is basically one or more casualties in the shooting phase. There's a result of Overwatch and all models that you know, gain counter attack and rage until the end of that turn, which you know, I, I prefer. Um, obviously, I think we've lost our challenges uh, for things, but then uh, if you don't take the Emperor's Champions, do challenges, I think you know, you, you're not really that bothered about it. Um, 
again, all the other tactics here. Then we're into the Space Marine Armoury. And especially as you walk here. Got the chapter relics, which I think actually, from what I've re I read this all a bit earlier, but it's all pretty much the same. There's no real changes in, in, in the relics. Um, and of course we've got tactical objectives for us now. Um, I've actually bought the card set, which I might actually go through very briefly on a, in another video just to sort of show what's in them. But to be honest, it, you, you get all these cards as you do in your Pacific set. And um, on top of that, you get your essentially the larger data cards are just the chapter tactics written down for you and the combat doctrines. So you know you've got them to hand down to open the book up. Um, and we've got the profiles at the back there. Um, so anyway, so that's that's my first covert view. Um, I will be the first one to admit that it's probably a little bit all over the place because I haven't done one of these yet. I'm hoping to refine my uh, <laughs> my technique a bit. So if any any constructive criticism, please let me know, and I'll uh, adjust it to to fit it to what people actually want to to view. So I hope you enjoyed the codex review. This is Tom from Black Toad Studios. Goodbye.